So this is the site um, where, in uh, March of uh, 2001, so about uh, some months before the Twin Towers, the Buddhas that were in these ni two, the Buddhas that were in these niches. Now, there are two Buddhas, main large Buddhas. There were uh, that are very high, like 50 meters high. Uh, one is called the Eastern Buddha and one is called the Western <coughs> Buddha. This is the Western Buddha. Um, but both were blown up over a period of one month. Uh, by Mullah Omar and people. And actually what is not known very well uh, outside of Afghanistan is that it was uh, internal also ethnic rivalry because the Taliban are mostly Pashtun and the Hazara are the people who live in this region. <coughs> and the Hazara, mm, there are a lot of troubles between the Hazara who were considered second-rate <coughs> citizens traditionally in they are often like if you have a, a cleaning woman or a cleaner in the house, they are Hazara. They look a little more like Chinese. They are closer to the uh, Mongolian ethnicities than to the Pakistani, Iranian kind of looking other um, Tajiks or Pashtuns and so on. So there are these ethnic conflicts also that lie behind this act. But aside from that, it had to do with uh, the iconoclasm of the Taliban in Afghanistan and with the media. So um, they're giving this media image. And it happened, uh, yeah, I was very shocked by it, I remember. And I remember conversations with people saying, but why are you so shocked, I mean, about this destruction of art? It's true, it's terrible, but you weren't crying like this when there was this happening and that happening and that happening that didn't have to do with art. And I somehow feel that the bodies of culture are very close to the bodies of people and that I felt it as something very ominous. And in fact, it sort of was. <laughs> And um, also there are trajectories that have to do with personal histories because um, Andrea Bruno is an Italian architect who is from Torino and um, he went, uh, there are many connections with Afghanistan between archaeologists and various other people throughout the decades, including Boetti, as I mentioned to you, the Arte Povera artist. But Andrea Bruno, the architect from Torino, who had renovated the Castello di Rivoli, <laughs> where I was working, he was also the person who, as a young man in the 60s, had gone and uh, protected this mountain because basically there, with si some sort of infiltrations of stone and things that would avoid the water going down in these channels and um, consuming the Buddhas. So <coughs> it was this paradox between this uh, work, maybe, by Andrea Bruno of protecting something that had been there for almost 2,000 years, and then the fact that it disappeared in, in just one month, you know, and it had survived 2,000 years. And so uh, these are some of the things that I was thinking about in thinking about the Bamiyan Buddhas. And when Documenta started, my work for Documenta, I immediately thought that uh, I remembered my friend Alighiero Boetti, and he had had this one hotel that he was running half of the year because he was an avant garde artist in the West half the year, and half the year he was a hotel running person in Kabul ever since 1971 until about 77 or 78 when the Soviet starts, period starts, and then he never went back. And he told me always that his, the one hotel had been bombed and destroyed. You know, I thought it didn't exist, this building in Kabul. And so I had associated these stories of contemporary art <laughs> with stories of recent events in Afghanistan. And then I was thinking about the relationship between being in Kassel, 
where uh, there is this paradox of this greatly important art exhibition, Joseph Boyce and so many artists and thinkers happening in the place that was also the center of the military armament industry during the Nazi period. So uh, these contradictions and the sense of what, what is to be done uh, brought me to looking at other places that were in periods of reconstruction, of immediate post-war reconstruction. So when, when Documenta starts, we're talking about 1949, 1948 are the first ideas that Bode has. Takes him five or six years, and 55 it opens. So he's working in a city that is occupied, you know, by the liberators. You know, you have American tanks running around, and it's a city that has been only recently returned to being populated because after the bombings of 43, Hitler didn't allow the S Germans of Kassel to live in Kassel, so they were displaced. So aside from the dead people, they were displaced outside of the city. So in a way, it was a little bit, for over a year and a half, or two years even, it was a little bit like one imagines, I mean, for me it was a little bit, like one imagines Phnom Penh with nobody in. So I was imagining the city where the plants and the weeds were growing and the cats were there and the flowers in the Awe Park and the rubble, and nobody's there because only the military could go in. And, and then suddenly this other, forces coming in the, and, and the whole period of reconstruction. And it made me wish to look at other contexts and places in the world that were undergoing today something that is, of course, not similar because everything is the history that is totally different, but that would have some characteristics that would be similar. And Afghanistan had just uh, returned to a more or less democracy. Uh, the museums were opening, the Kabul Archaeological Museum opening, uh, schools for children and girls were going back to school. and th The whole country was being rebuilt at the same time as it was occupied by the liberating forces and same sort of situation you have in America. And the problem of Germany having to build itself as a democracy after the war uh, the problem of nationhood. So uh, knowing that, y that nationalism brought to an extreme can bring to fascism may have, according to Ashraf Ghani, for example, who wrote the book Failing, um, uh, uh, Failed States or something like this, an Afghan um, um, politician who was the one of the candidates who didn't get any votes for the last presidential elections when Karzai won. Ashraf Ghani, who's a very interesting intellectual um, Marxist and then studied at Columbia and then decided to go back and he was one of the return diaspora building the country. When I interviewed him ab about this question, he said, well, the analogy is that it is the, f it's, it's, it's about building an Islamic state knowing that to, that, that if you, the extremes to which Islamism can bring. So how to build a national state knowing the extremes, uh, how to build an Islamic state knowing this. So there's this tension that could be also another thing to think about if, if I were to write about it or think about it, he said. So anyway, because I found it rather unethical to simply connect Kassel to places in the world where trauma and conflict had occurred and that were in a state of, of reconstruction and the building of civil society, because I thought that was a little bit violent to simply go anywhere in the world that would be in that context. One could have picked Cambodia, you know, one could have picked a number of places around the world. I refrained from it, but because there was a story that had to do with our stories, the stories of the art world, the stories of art, the stories that Vasari tells in his Lives of the Artists, the stories that we tell each other about artists moving from this place to that place or doing this or doing that, the stories around art. Because Afghanistan 
had this story that is our one of our stories. Another story is, you know, Robert Barry in Halifax and the stories of meeting up there during the summers and what happened. So stories, there are stories. So this story of Boetti somehow gave uh, a legitimation, in my view, for something like Documenta to be involved in Afghanistan. So it is the fact that, let's say, history, but also the micro-history of the art community met in this crux, which is the story of this artist's life, who was from Arte Povera, from Torino, myself, him being one of my mentors, and so on. This very personal story of the relationship with Boetti, what he taught me about the world. He always said that art is only bringing into the world what is already there, you know? That, so that might be one of the roots. Mettere al mondo il mondo, to bring the world into the world, was one of the words that he wrote with his ballpoint pen monochrome works, Mettere al mondo il mondo, because so much of the vision of Arte Povera and the vision of his work was in my background. And because that story was a story that lies at the roots of the need to negotiate Western modernities and transnational alliances that can be forged ar across the globe, because of the early period in which he was addressing that question, for good and for bad, with the results that one might think are positive or not. But he was one of the only artists in Europe that at that time was wishing to deal with the question of uh, the world at large, and artisticness at large, the aesthetic at large. How does my being an avant-garde artist in the tradition of Western modernity meet the history of um, s cultures and civilizations that in the background don't necessarily have that, and may have, for example, a very different relationship or imp attribution of importance to decoration, for example, and patterning, for example. So these are questions that so many people have addressed after, but at that time, it, it was quite rare <laughs> to be thinking about these things. So patterning, color, decoration, bringing the povertà of decoration into the sphere of high art and removing it from the sphere of craft in the normal, except for in very s remote feminist s circles, that wasn't really being thought about um, much, this question of, of craft, for example, and decoration, and what makes art art, and how one can reimagine what art is in a broader way, and so on. Uh, taking into consideration all these different cultures and histories of civilization <coughs> around the world. So, because of that particular story of Boetti and the way that it, it evolved, it, even within the story, you know, with the story that Boetti's hotel was bombed and destroyed and he had to leave, and the story of his tapestries, his, his, um, the tapestries made um, with tapestry makers in Kabul in the one hotel on the drawings that he would send or give to them while he was there and work with them, actually. Because of all of this, I thought that it was okay, you know. <laughs> it somehow was okay to go. And uh, we didn't go with the idea of doing a section of Documenta there at all. We just went with the idea of looking for the one hotel. <laughs> and we being um, these people. So the first trip was um, Mariam Ghani. She was an Afghan diaspora artist living in New York. Um, Michael Tausik. I asked Mick Tausik to come with me. I don't know why. I, I just thought it was an interesting thing. And uh, Francis Alice and Mario Garcia Torres. Mario, because of his interest in um, the Boetti story, which dates back to 2006, when he had a residency in Italy at the Ratti Foundation in Como. He began to be interested in the story of the one hotel in, in um, Kabul, and, but had not gone there. So this is just a group in here. And okay, um, what 
the pictures are kind of strange. Um, I also asked Mike Rakovitz to come. Actually, I forgot Mike. <laughs> he was, he also came. And the reason for asking Mike Rakovitz to come um, is because he had been working for a while on the project, the uh, invisible enemy is whatever. The invisible enemy. Let me try to find that title, um, which had to do with the Baghdad Museum, the looting and destruction of the objects in the Baghdad Museum. So I thought he was interested. He would be very sensitive to the invisible enemy should not exist is a project that he started and is an ongoing project where um, he uh, does these moments of workshop where he rebuilds with other people telling each other stories the <coughs> objects, the thousands of objects that were in the Baghdad Museum and that had been lost and looted and they're, they're all recorded on many websites and through the fact that the police try to get them back, they were looted the day after the American troops entered into Baghdad. So there was this irony or paradox that Mike, the artist, who was born in Iraq, and he's an um, Iraqi Jewish diaspora, uh, grew up in Brooklyn but was born in, in Iraq. Uh, he was taken aback by the paradox of this liberation of Baghdad from Saddam Hussein the day after which the museum had lost thousands of precious objects that had been there for so long. It was one of the most important museums in the Middle East. So he decided to do a reconstruction of these objects slowly. And it's an ongoing project, so whenever he has a chance or has an occasion, he does a workshop and he'll pick some off the internet because the police have all the pictures, you know, and they got some of them back, you know, from soldiers and people that had taken them. And they got a lot back, but they didn't get all of them back. So it's a very colorful, joyful, uh, papier mache objects, lab you know, it covered with labels from consumer objects, uh, it's goods that, that papier mache rebuild, remaking of these. And every workshop is accompanied by storytelling and the stories of the director of the Baghdad Museum and the stories are, uh, and the story of the object is here. Uh, and it's been shown, it kind of is a very uh, globalized artwork in a way, because it lives in all these incarnations. For example, this was when it was in Sharjah, at the Sharjah Biennale. Some of the other pictures were in Istanbul. This is still Sharjah. Some, the, it's been shown in um, Chicago at the, in the exhibition now about archaeology, the shovel and the, spa the, the shovel exhibition that Dieter Rolstrat has just curated. It's been shown in um, London and many places. So it's an ongoing work, which again brings together people around objects, let's say, which seems to be like in the work of Fajbovic and Goldberg, somehow a characteristic either of this documenta or of our times that there is something going on between things and their materialities and people. So it's not performance art, it's not sculpture, it's not social sculpture, but it's something in the relations between people and things that make this, it's not installation, but it's something performance slash installation slash relational slash sculpture. And often contingent on the presence of an object there that creates a field where something can occur, which is why that photograph of the Gonzalez sculptures and the man and the woman were so important also because it's this field of relation between the human and the inhuman, let's say, in specifically the art object, which is not the artwork. The artwork is the project that entails all of this that we've discussed, but the art object um, as being a stand-in for all inhuman or non-human things or materials with which we relate, uh, which makes the collecting of today's artworks very difficult <laughs> because people will collect, you know, a piece of this table and da -da -da. so it remains as a kind of marker or leftover um, of an artwork which is very also performative under the form of workshop or some sort of teaching 
or being together situation. So because he had been working on this for some years, I decided to invite him, and that's what a curator does also. They think this particular artist is particularly sensitive to this particular kind of problematique. So what happens if you take Mike Rakowitz, who's done this project around the Baghdad Museum, and connect it with Bamiyan? Not just connect it in your way of installing the works. It's not about installing the Bactrian princess and installing an artwork by Mike Rakowitz and making a connection, which is how the generals prepare war. It is about opening up the possibility of worlding. What stories do we tell so that other stories can be told? What story did he tell with the Baghdad Museum so that other stories could be told with Bamiyan? And my point is actually not linking or connecting or making an a purely curatorial association, but it is in creating the conditions for that other entity which doesn't exist in the world to emerge and come into the world. So I invited him. And no, I don't want to close all tabs. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know what I want to do with all this. Okay, so Mike visited uh, Kabul and we went to Bamiyan and he decided to do a two-partite, tripartite artwork. And the artwork was called in Kassel, What Dust Will Rise? And I'm going to show you. This is the installation in Kassel. And a close-up of the vitrine, one of the vitrines is this. So it combines a number of uh, stone-carved books, uh, objects looking like books, on glass transparent tables, on which glass there were notations in pen, and a number of vitrines previously belonging to the Landesmuseum in Kassel and basically thrown away, put in the deposits. Um, Landesmuseum in Kassel was the museum for um, pre-20th century art, and it was the museum of decorative arts as well. So you would have cups and tea teapots and things in these historical objects that ha have to do with the history of Hesia, would have been located in these vitrines previously to Mike's installation. And what, he, what you saw there and what you read, I mean, storytelling is very much part of Mike's work. So it, you didn't need the wall text of the curator. He had his own wall text. And the wall text spoke about the materials out of which these books were made. And the materials out of which these books were made were stone coming from, it's a limestone, coming from the Bamiyan Buddha area. So from the same cliffs where the Bamiyan Buddhas were. And he reminded the viewers that with this drawing, for example, that the Buddhas had been blown up. And these objects here are shrapnel from leftover bombs of the Bamiyan Buddha site, uh, which he picked up when he was there. Uh, and other shrapnel from other exploded bombs. So you could call it evidence in a way. It's evidence in a story or an objects that refer to a story. And also, uh, there were references in this. St so you knew that the materials were for coming from the mount those mountains. Uh, but the shape of the books were actually, the shape of the books are books copied from the surviving books that survived the bombings of Kassel and the Friedrichshanum during the bombing in particular of 1941. Um, so there is no logic that is reasonable <laughs> to make this book out of the shape of this. Uh, th this is not the exact model of that at all, obviously, but um, th there is no logic behind saying, I'm going to make, I'm going to remake the book, I'm going to enter into some form of symbolic reparation and remake the book out of the Bamiyan Buddha site stone in the shape of the books that were destroyed in Castle. Uh, there's no logic to that. It's illogical. You know, why do you do that? If you ask, why do you do that? I mean, it's almost a strange, like a strange metaphor that doesn't make any sense. You know, 
it's like wrong. It's like art historically is historian's nightmare, you know, to take this object of material culture <laughs> that's supposed to tell one story and bring it together with the materials from another his material culture of another story that has no connection whatsoever with the first one. So it's a nightmare I of a historian. It makes no sense, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make any sense because he did it. And the people who carved these books are, I mean, we can go into all the connections. I'm, I'm not really saying it makes no sense, but from a sort of a logical historical perspective of any historical research to discover anything that we can then publish as a new knowledge in the sphere of our knowledge of the history of Europe or our knowledge of the history of Afghanistan, there is no new knowledge. So there is no knowledge created here that it constituted knowledge in a way. But what he does tell us is that these books were crafted. First, he tells us that he himself was a stone carver prior to being a conceptual performance research-based artist. He, was a, he started his life as a stone carver. And he tells us also that when he was studying as a student at art school, he had two or three images before him that he used in his class. One of them was the Bamiyan Buddhas. One of them was the Pietà of Michelangelo. And that when the Buddhas blew up, he was really quite shocked because it, it lay at the birth of his studies as a young artist at school. Um, so we know that. And this was not carved by him. It was carved by master stone carvers um, in the north of Italy, um, near, Trie near Trieste, actually. And these are the Cosmateschi. They are the most uh, well-known stone carvers in Italy that continue traditions from the Middle Ages. Uh, to today. So he went to the one of the highest, let's say, places of European craft to craft these books that had been destroyed with the stone that was used to make the Bamiyan Buddhas, but not the leftover pieces of the Buddhas, stone from the same area. And that was all that was in the exhibition. Well, it I mean, there were many stories about the bombing of this, um, of the bombing of Castle, and someone remi Griselda reminded me that in his captions and his storytelling, he tells the story that there were pieces of Coventry that. Yes, that were that when I had bombed, forgotten that. When the RAF bombed Germany, they dumped the rubble of Coventry, which had been bombed by the German Air Force, back on Germany. So in addition to the bombs, they dumped a whole bunch of rubbish. Yes. So there was this, this rubble from the yes, other site, which just amazing. was, it just, it was like one of those kind of moments where your, your mind blows up at the whole notion of, of Coventry raining down on, on the poor Cassellians who, on the, in this, curious way, there is this sort of matter, so it's another of these. Yes, it's another transaction of matter which with symbolic meaning, but yes, it's it, and, and so you have this stone from Kabul, uh, from Bamiyan, <coughs> falling on castle. <laughs> you have German troops occupying Afghanistan. You have rubble from Coventry falling on castle. You have this sort of web of web of conflicts uh, going on in through the materials of the of, of stone through the material of stone so um, that was all there was in Kassel and in Kabul however or actually in Bamiya in Kabul he there was a, a part of the exhibition and there was the exhibition of this book this is the exhibition in Kabul uh, the guy with the green scarf is the um, education department person. We, we, the, the, there were like t 20 people from the university who became documenta storytellers. <laughs> and the they would the tell. The documenta scarf, or was that? Yes, that's yes, the documenta scarf, scarf, the same ones that were in Castle. Yeah. And they wore them. You see, the documenta scarf you can wear as ever you want. You know, that was something that I also did. Well, you did a demonstration about how you could wear this documenta scarf. 
yes, so everybody wore it how they wanted. <laughs> that was so he's explaining the exhibition to the visitors here, and this is the room without um, without visitors. Uh, and here on the wall is also the story of the fact that this particular book, which is this one, was a book that was not destroyed, survived the bombings, uh, because it was parchment, not paper, and um, it dried after the bombings, the days after the bombings. And the way that it reacted to heat and to drying, being it's skin, you know. It's it's the body of of animals, the parchment, parchment. So it's skin. So of course the this carried many assonances with Mike about bodies and skin and burning and and ovens and all of that. Um, but it also turned into this accordion type figure, a sort of musical instrument almost that he was found very beautiful as a form which turned into this book, which now, as part of his participation in the documenta, uh, was donated to the Ar National Archaeological Museum of Kabul. So near the fragments of the Buddhas that were destroyed in Kabul, not in Bamiyan, you have this object. So this is another um, story, small detail of a story, of how things continue, the after effects of documenta. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, someone visiting the Archaeological Museum in Kabul will look at this and look at this, and then it will be Mike Ragnar's 2012, a book in the shape of a burnt book in castle made by northern Italian stone makers with stone from Bamiyan, donated in 2012. You know, so there's this. Uh, and his title, the piece, was What Dust Will Rise. You know, what dust will rise is a, a part of an expression, an Afghan expression as well, which is what dust will rise with only one horseman, which means you cannot do anything on your own. You have to collaborate as a group. Mm -hmm. What dust will rise with one horseman? Nothing. So um, his piece is called, the whole project is called What Dust Will Rise. But the artwork exists in a, p in a series of, lines of flight going in many directions, which is why you cannot say where the artwork is. It is in this display in Castle. It is in that display in Kabul. It is in this object in the National Gallery, uh, in the, excuse me, in the Archaeological Museum of Kabul. It is in what goes on today in Bamiyan. We don't know. It's in all of these places. It has many different outputs, the same way that we have many different hats in our age. You know, I'm an artist, I'm a curator, I'm a bookbinder, I'm a, a psychotherapist, and I'm also a mother, and I'm this and that. You know, most people will answer this. So why should an artwork also have such a defined status of what it is, you know, where, where it is? It, it, it is the object in the Kabul Museum. It is the workshop that he did, which I would like to show you now uh, um, and tell you about. Um, and it is in many places and ways. Now, one of the ways that it took place, this artwork, is a workshop uh, to teach people to do sculpture in Bamiyan. Bamiyan is a rather large town, but people have not been doing sculpture for many centuries because it wasn't part of the tradition anymore after the Buddhist thing collapsed. I mean, it continued, but not so much. But it had been part of the tradition for way before the Buddhist period, thousands of years, because of the softness of the stone. And if you look at the mountains, you really see that it's not about, ba it's not about Buddha <laughs> or Buddhism. Um, you see how there's all these little holes. It's like a Gruyere cheese. And in all of these little holes are thousands of Buddhas. Uh, people sculpted them very small all over the place. So the city is in the valley below. Let me just show you Bamiyan. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful valley. You see, the A77 is the old si Silk Route. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas are on this side. But all along here, 
And it has something to do also with Boeti because Bamyan is very near the Bandamir Lakes, which I'll show you, which is where Arigiro wanted his ashes to be thrown after he died. So if you look at these landscape, um, like this one, you'll see, oh, here's the Eastern Buddha and the Western Buddha and all of them, if we can get this picture. This is the Western Buddha, this is Eastern Buddha. These are the two that were blown up. This Buddha is the seated Buddha that had been already destroyed in the mid-90s. And all of these are holes with Buddhas. And the city of Bamyan is looking towards that. So in a way, it's a little bit as if on a symbolic level, I think the people of Bamyan for thousands of years were engraving people in the, it's like an other city, a little bit like the city of the dead in, in Luxor, you know, on the other side of the river. Um, I think it has something to do with understanding death. <laughs> this is just my idea, that it has to do with population and people and the fact that we will go back to the mountain and we will be in the mountain and there are all our ancestors in the mountain and it's full of people, whether it's dust, dust, or it's me being dust. So in one of those particular um, caves, I think it's exactly this one, or right behind it, it's at this height, Mike Rakov is proposed to do a workshop on sculpture. So he went back to his earliest period, like Tastadin went back to her earliest period. And he invited people of all ages and um, gender, and the mayor of Bamyan even took part in it. And to, to, uh, together with an Afghan uh, sculptor who does um, mainly tombstones and stuff, they both together taught this workshop collab collaboratively. And they were working with Bernd Praxenthaler, who is also one of the archaeologists uh, who, from Munich, was working on the Eastern Buddha, because the German government archaeologists work on the Eastern Buddha. Everybody, it's like split up. It's a UNESCO sort of site for taking care of them and so on. And I would like to show you a few minutes of this workshop. But prior to showing you that, I want to tell you that what was then the result of the workshop in Bamyan was exhibited in the Kabul exhibition of Documenta. I think I can show you if there's a picture. We saw these two pictures, but we didn't see. Hmm. I can't see a picture of the room. OK, I can't see a picture of the room with these objects. But what I wanted to tell you is that these objects, he did not want to show them in Castle. So again, there was this kind of eth it was an ethical political discussion that went on about um, the voyeurism of wanting to show, ha, ah, these are the objects that were sculpted by the Afghans in the workshop in, Ka in Bamyan that he felt that that was a voyeuristic and uninteresting, and it didn't make sense because this is a workshop for um, you know, Art Students 101. So what, what, what wouldn't it make any sense? But uh, it was part of the exhibit. In all of these niches, there was Buddhas here, back here. There was one b centuries ago. So um, and the reason for doing this workshop was that there is a debate going on in UNESCO and in the government in Afghanistan, which is tension. There's a tension. Because the Afghans want to rebuild the Bamiyan Buddhas. And the international archaeologists and the UNESCO don't want to rebuild the Afghan, the Bamiyan Buddhas. They think it's kitsch, and it's like Euro Disney, and it shouldn't be done. It's absurd. It goes against all Western considerations around conservation which from the time of the 1940s and 30s were premises laid down by an Italian, actually. Um, the principles of contemporary, that went against the principles of Violette Le Duc in the 19th century, which had to do with reconstruction. And the, it was a good thing to rebuild things. And that went swaying to the opposite in the 20th century with um, the man who wrote the principles, the 20 principles that are also still at the basis of UK, everywhere around the world, in the West, conservation principles. Like, if you do reintegrate, if you do add new material, it must be visible that it's different. It's not the original material. So if you're putting color back, it has to be a trateggio, and you have to be visible from close. But from far, you can see the effect. Uh, all of these are uh, that have to do with um, the original intention, also, of the artist has to be respected. 
and so on and so forth. Uh, so um, because of these principles of Western conservationism, conservation art, everybody's against rebuilding these Buddhas. But the, both the local community in Bamiyan, most people, citizens of Bamiyan, and many people in the government of Afghanistan would love to do it because they don't see why not. You know, because the Buddhas were carved and then fell apart and carved and fell apart for centuries all over that for like 150 kilometers. So they see as a fetishization the fact that we must keep these holes. Most of them. And this is a political tension. So the artist comes in, speaking about politics and arts and what artists do. Mike comes in and says, hmm, what to do, what to do? Well, I don't think anybody should decide what's going to happen there except for the people that are there over time. They'll figure it out by themselves. So what I can do is be a catalyst to simply empower the ability to carve. So I will do a workshop in sculpture and teach people to do sculpture that then can do sculpture that then can do sculpture. And I mean, it's who knows what will happen in 10 years, 20 years. There might not be the Buddha in that place. There might be something else carved a kilometer down the road. But there might be the Buddha again. It, it's not predictable. But I just make the ball roll. So the artistic project was a project of empowerment within of first and, and, and the creation of a third position. You know, we said, oh, uh, I wanted to show you the little film of the workshop, because I have a little documentation of it. Uh, just to stop talking. <laughs> Uh, we don't have the sound, though. I have to plug it in. Oh, here it is. Yes, yes. So this is not an artwork. You know, this document is not on sale by his gallery or anything. It's just something that he uses in his talks. It's just a few minutes. But there's something quite oniric again, you know, it's more typical of dreams where substitutions and removals and slippages occur, that you kind of go back from Bamiyan, go home and you have this dream that there's this workshop of sculpture. And it has some surreal quality to it. a little bit the imaginary system. I mean, I believe in uh, the way that art puts things into the world that can alter the imaginary system that is controlled very much by individuals who decide what is to be seen on CNN, what is to be seen on um, Al Jazeera also. And you can actually interfere with those systems. It has to do with what Judith Butler wrote in her book frames of war, where she speaks about the frames of recognizability and how the frames of recognizability can be altered. And, and, and that that's part of the commitment to modify the frames of recognizability of a place, a person, a history. Mm. It's almost over. It's just it's funny because at the end there's the mayor, you know, so then there's the guard. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that this is art, actually. I don't even think, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say, actually, I don't think so. I think it's, it's part of a broader project that is art. And it doesn't really matter to me, actually, if it's art. I don't, but I don't think the video is art. No. Yes, yes. Please speak while you're. Oh, um, it seems to me to link, though, with what you said at the very beginning of your session yesterday, which was 
your question about or your speculation about where art was now yes it seems to me to link very much with that these kinds of activities which are initiated by artists okay um, I'm not talking about this particular film yes, as yes, art yes. or not. Uh, uh, I'm talking about so the called activist art yeah, the projects. Or, no, no, not activist place. art projects. Just a, what is initiated yes. by an artist? Yes. Okay. Is maybe what the processes are yeah, initiated? Yeah. What yes. processes are initiated? Um, is is where art is in one sense now? Okay. That's interesting. Not not activist art. I don't mean as a category. Yeah, because that I mean the as, as an attitude or an initiation yes. of something. Yes. That seems I to think me so. Catalyzing yeah. things like catalyzing yeah. the Afghan film Abs uh, rep uh, restoration projects, catalyzing. But when you were talking about uh, his his logic being a nightmare for an art historian, <laughs> okay, yes. it's actually a dream for an artist. Yes. Oh, here you see the valley outside. So this is what the Buddhas were looking at. By the way, speaking about different yeah. po uh, positions, the they Buddhas were looking, looking at, at that for centuries. Yeah. There's an amazing novel, which I can't get out of my head as I'm watching this, by Michael Ondaatje, um, which is about a young forensic uh, archaeologist or... That's uh, the Hindu Kush. Sorry, yeah, you see yeah. the mountains in the back? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, she goes back to, to Sri Lanka just at the point at which is a very, very dangerous thing to do, and there's constant uh, you know, terror all around her. But she works with... Um, Somebody, they discover a, a body which ultimately obviously has been knocked off by the government. But it's very interesting that they have to recover what this body is. Hmm. And watching that because they work out that he must have been something because the nature of his ankles. So that he has to have been sitting cross-legged, putting certain kinds of pressure. So they work out that he's actually a sculptor. Huh. And he was the Buddha maker. And the thing to do with the Buddhas is that you, you construct them, you, you sculpt them, but you are not allowed to look into their eyes. So the ma they have a special painter who comes at the very end with his assistant, huh. right, who is blinded, blindfolded, who has to hold up a mirror so that the painter has to paint the eyes backwards. How interesting. So there's a whole fascinating kind of dimension about the, going back to what you were saying about when you invest art objects with a certain kind of um, ritual or sec, you know, sort of ritual or, or sacred power, sort of around them, but I was just very fascinated by this, you know, the, the level at which you're training people to carve feet. Yes. And I'm just wondering, obviously, when you're carving these big Buddhas, I mean, like all of these things, you make them un, um, out of bits. You yes, can't. Yes, yes. Sculpt of something of that great point level, you know, but you obviously, I don't know if they did that, et cetera, but watching them learn the elements, going back to your Bactrian princesses and their perfect fit, these sort of elements, and so, but that really is the most extraordinary novel. If anybody's interested, it's because it's, it's, it captures something in a very different, in a literary ma way, yes. about this zones of conflict, zones of trauma, the kind of terror on which these things, the uncovering, the use and the forensic archaeology, uh, for in, when it's sort of forensic, I mean, there's a lot, of, what, are the, what are they actually called, these people, so there's a lot of work about the people who went to Rwanda who had to do these forensic, they are forensic archaeologists, yes. to recover the bodies, to identify things that we just had this one very recently, which are these tr very, very bodily traces of these visits. But the thing about the Buddha, you're not, you have to paint it backwards, like looking in a mirror. I just thought that was very That's fascinating. Amazing. Did you want to say huh. something, Jen? Um, I Thank you. I've had my question answered. Um, I was wondering how they got into the cave. And oh, when you showed that picture, the steps. Yeah, yeah, up at, up at the left. You uh, Actually, when we are here in this first picture, I showed you, uh, where is it? Um, this one? We're right up at the top of where the Buddhas are. That's where, of course, Andrea Bruno was working above, you know, to consolidate the f mountain side and so on. This is leftover tank, Soviet tank, <laughs> that Francis Alice is leaning on. The, um, the, the stories that um, 
artists tell that you kind of have the power to influence to a certain extent in choosing artists or working together with uh, with them, curating them. Not um, anymore. I'm no, well, not uh, but, but at, right now. Yeah, at, at some point. <laughs> yes. At some point. I mean, you, you had an active yes. role in it. Yes, you know, super. A catalytic, yeah, yeah. you know, role in it. Um, a what role? A ca catalytic or oh, catalytic. agential yes, yes. or, yes. you know. Um, yes, 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 yeah. yes. I agree. Um, yes. So... Are these stories that um, are imbued with a, s a certain authority? Um, are, are they are they being questioned now, or are other stories developing out of those stories? I mean, in, in, you know, on, on a storytelling level. Um, uh, I don't, yes, I, don't I think know, you know, other so stories are happening? being developed for sure. There are an infinite number of stories going on now in Afghanistan or in people's minds. I, I mean, I don't know it, all the stories, but I do think that these stories generate stories. And there are also chapters of stories. Uh, you know, Tacita did her book after the documenta. It wasn't part of the documenta, so it is a story that continued. Mm -hmm. You mean, I mean, does the mm -hmm. story of Boeti change? Of course the story of Boeti changes, because the story that was told was that it ended. The one hotel, and now the story of the one hotel has another chapter to it, which is that the one hotel was used for Mario Garcia was Mario Garcia Torres's artwork. You know, he used his budget to restore the one hotel building and take off the bars and plant the roses in the garden and paint and put clean up the furniture and host people and serve tea and uh, host many of the seminars we had. Natasha Zader Hagigian, the um, Iranian artist who lives between Berlin and, Ir and Tehran, she did her seminar in the One Hotel. So that is part of Mario Garcia Torres's artwork. And that is a story that has changed the story of Alighiero Boetti's One Hotel. Mm -hmm. You cannot now avoid this mm -hmm. other chapter to the mm -hmm. story. No, I, was, I was just, just wondering, or you know, just, just, uh, just an, uh, an open question. Are there certain media, certain channels who are trying to give certain stories, uh, you know, particular authority? No. I don't know. Not? Maybe. Is there, you know, are there gatekeepers, policing, you know? And, and, and on the other hand, um, what about the tension? I mean, as you said, you know, historical um, his historians or, you know, historical knowledge always being kind of, you know, imbued with this, with this aura of authenticity, truth, and, and all that, and, and, and as soon as you 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 kind of not not declassify this not, not not the right word but say it is part of an art but you want your art also to be very specific very detailed very culturally uh, you know Im embedded so you have this this tension of course and this ongoing tension using something that may not be necessarily super historically correct like using material from one um, period and you know putting it together with uh, with other th things that would make sense within the the kind of the uh, the overall artwork, but maybe not for you know a historian who would look at it from a more evidence based or documentary um, type type of perspective. But then when the work has been built, has had its own history, personal history or so, um, it of course changes. Of course, you know, and all all works have an af afterlife. So so how is this? I, d I don't know, I'm, I'm just imagining here something, um, this, this tension between, you know, using other people's histories or, you know, things that have happened in a, um, well, in a, in a very imaginative, very creative way on the one hand, but maybe, possibly, I don't know, insisting on the, on the, the kind of the authenticity and the historical truth or specificity of your own artwork once it's been taken out of a context and then develops further on in, in, in the future. Just, you know, wondering by other people, Does you know, being used by... I uh, don't know. Does anyone have anything to say to that? I mean, I don't understand exactly. It's not that Mike Rakovitz is saying the Bamiyan Buddhas blew up in some other place. He's not saying anything that is not is against <coughs> the histories of those places. Or mm -hmm. th there are no, there can be some fictions. Like for example, you you can't know if that workshop really happened or if this was staged with actors. You don't know that. I mean, I'm telling you that, and he's telling us that. 
But you don't know if that's true. I could be lying. This could be just a performance, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and on that level, yeah. you can't know. You're just, it, and it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, if you want the tail, you can take the tail. Um, that brings up, I mean, if that's your question, I mean, is this historical fact? Did we actually, did we actually rent the one hotel? Uh, you know, if you want to find out if that's true, you can go and find the documents. As a historian, you can go and find the rental contract that was signed by the director of the Goethe Kabul and the owners of the building, and you would say, oh, well, then it's true. I mean, if, the, if that's the purpose, if the purpose is to find out if this is all a fiction or if there's historical fact to... If the document ever happened in Kabul or ever happened in Kassel, you can find out if it ever happened in Kassel, either by believing the fact that a certain number of witnesses went. And so statistically, so many people say that it happened in Kassel. It must have happened, even though you personally didn't go. Mm -hmm. right? No, no, that, so that wasn't so much oh, uh, the my, my question. The was not the question. No, oh, I um, the, there are, there are um, just, just coming out of um, uh, you know, cultural studies work um, having to do with historical truth. I mean, film, you know, rep re representation of what anything. What is historical truth? I mean, I, know. I don't believe in revisionism, so what but... What are you really asking? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, um, is there a, um, a, a tension in the development of, of an artwork that when, when artists um, use material that's, that, that already has a, a particular specific history, um, and, and you just you just mentioned it in you know in, 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 in one sentence where you said it's a it's a nightmare for a kind of you know historian or no, if, if I the nightmare that. is that it is not justified as part of historical research to spend your time and money carving books out of Bamyan Buddha stone in the shape of books that were burnt in Kassel. That brings no historical knowledge. Mm -hmm to the body of knowledge of history of neither one place nor the other. Yeah. So that is the nightmare. The nightmare is that one would be spending time and funding and people and energy to do something that gives you no more further knowledge, neither about the Nazis and Germany yeah. and, and the British and the bombing, nor about that. But it has nothing to do with um, the work itself that was made enters into that history with an artwork. So yeah. the artwork has brought these two disparate things and stories together, has linked them forever. So from now on, you cannot speak about castle bombed books without at least saying there's this part of the story that it, they were created by, they were remade by this artist called Mike Rakovitz for the Documenta 13. I mean, you can't. You, you have this new element of history, which is an artwork. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, once the Sistine Chapel is made, the Sistine Chapel is made, and it enters into the history of Rome and of the Vatican, and of uh, and 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 you just take it into consideration. It's like a new material that, as a historian, you take into consideration. But it's not that Mike Rakovitz has reread past historical readings and contradicted them. He's not doing that. Some artists have done that. You know, there are many artworks that are based on uh, revealing some history that's not been told and that needs to be told or whatever. So th that happens. Uh, this is not that. This is um, not that. But I don't know if that's the answer to your question. I, 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 can I intervene there a little bit? Because. Um, <coughs> If we take the word the nightmare out, because I thought Alison did very nicely, because what is a nightmare for a historian might be a dream for an artist. It's yes. A, it's a very interesting exactly. kind of play on this, etc. But what I thought you were, ra were raising up and have been raising up in, in the way that you conceptualized and you know, brought do documentary into being is that there are logics which are what people in art history are trained to think are the only logics by which you can make connections. You know, succession, style, influence, certain yes. kinds of consistencies. But there are also post Foucault genealogies. So we, we go back to Nietzsche, then we go through Foucault, we understand the possibilities. So, um, in for instance, the, um, you know, my virtual feminist museum, both, um, well, there's a quote from Adrian Rifkin about this is the most unreasonable 
Yes, I project. remember that. Project. So, and that was, I thought, thank goodness, because I'm working against the so-called reason of art history to reveal that there are other configurations which will produce for us some different understanding yes. of different kinds of relationalities which cross, which are not based on chronology, sequence, succession, right? And that I learned a lot from this from, you know, talking to Alison, mm -hmm. going to museums and understanding that artists simply didn't see what the art historian is being trained to find as the only logics with which you can connect art with. So this idea of configuration. You mean like influence. To and see the influence from one artist to another yeah, would all be. Of these, uh, these, these yeah. tying things in some sort of unilinear or um, classificatory or categorizable el element. Whereas the incident, of you, what you've been talking about in one sense is the incident, the rupture, the event, the encounter, the translation, the, encounter. the, the, mm. the Hermes, that we're all using these new words and struggling with the sense that do they fall into a kind of unreason that has no um, possible kind of retrieval? Are they just fantasies? And I think what Brenda's getting at is, again, going back to our kind of responsibility and even where we did in the first session, why we were reading Barad and the question of this sort of ethical that if we enter into the world where we say, okay, we're abandoning classical Western reason mm -hmm. and the kind of categories, we are going to allow ourselves maybe to think momentarily artistically or be taught by artistic thinking, but also be taught by the electrons and the photons and their entanglements into other ways of thinking. Where might a certain responsibility meet a certain response ability. In the ability the, the, to respond. The, the ability to respond. And the sense, so in one sense, there is something resists simple projection, imagination, and um, instrumentalization of anything. We can't just jump out of history and say, oh, we can do anything we like. Mm -hmm. So that there seems to me what you were plotting out with, with Mike was a series of even elements. Not all of them constituted the moment which we'd say, Ha, ah, there's the transformation, there's the act, there's the, the work, uh, which did involve, when we went to see it, you know, it did involve walking around, it did yes. involve thinking about that, it did f remember oh, across the way that was where the museum, that these vitrines came from, and sensing their, they're literally their historical timing, yeah. you know, in something, and that they're being used in that sort of way, and all of those elements, the, the glass tables, the, you know, the, 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 what you, you know, all of the stuff and the, putting something as heavy as stone on the table. All of those elements were, the, were there to, to, ha to do their work, mm -hmm. right? And the configuration was both planned and required us to work that one out, which I found, anyway, I won't go to the Emily just here because that was the other side of it, etc. cetera. But um, when you then bring in the story of it, it's not that the story then is validates the work, it's that we then begin to think about another level of, mm -hmm. of its becoming. Mm -hmm. And I think Brenda's quite right to ask, well, where does that then exist as part of, in a sense, the aftermath? So one of the things mm -hmm. that I'm just thinking about is we're kind of bringing this round again, which is what, you know, the, the experience of working with you over the next six months to be both a community to think with you mm -hmm. as you think back over what Mm -hmm. happened also for us to understand a process which we're very interested in learning about what are these other processes for co what was behind or before yeah, or aside but, but it obviously something to do with the question of to what purpose no 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 just no. but this the question of the, the stories mm -hmm. and where they will ruin so if we go away do we go away and say you know i mean i think it's a very important question that that brenda's raised about where what we've learned from talking with you is for us in relation, because there isn't yet a model quite yeah. for So you for mean, what that. are we going to do with it? Th that no sounds way. too instrumental. No, it's no. just, it's the question yeah. which we're going to think about. You know, yeah. How Let's going to continue? Hmm? Yeah, the, but, but the, the sense it's, it's, it's an older kind of infinite. Um, so because these are very, very historical stories you're, you're mm -hmm. telling about the moments through which Documenta came to mm -hmm. be and different artists came in this. But, but I think the stories also, I mean, there are stories, but they are also enacted and embodied stories. And they are not stories also, because there are people living now 
doing certain things that they wouldn't have done had that not happened. Mm -hmm. So they do have very yeah, no, daily it's, life it's consequences. No life it's, just, it's very, very interesting to think about. On the symbolic level. Yeah. How these, you know, and, and what we're going to, how we're going to be different people now that we've shared some of these. Well, what do you think? Let me turn the question around. Oh, wait, first, go ahead. <laughs> when Brenda was speaking, I was just thinking that an intervention is different to a distortion, and it reminded me of something we read in the reading um, yesterday, um, the Barad piece, and she's just talking about, I'm going to, in an important set, sense touch is the primary concern of physics and just skipping a bit once you start looking at it this way you get a dizzying feeling as things shift this particular take on physics and its history may entail a talking a perturbation from the usual storylines but it is far from a gross distortion i offer this twist on the usual framing as a provocation for opening up new ways of thinking about both physics and touch and mm. it also reminded me of what um, Carolyn, you were talking about if um, I can't remember it specifically, but if people if people aren't working on certain projects, um, how a space that opens up could be then occupied or or um, reappropriated by the right. I can't remember exactly. Oh, that's interesting. But oh, I, yeah, yeah. I I think in terms of like thinking about the uh, historic like interventions in historical records that create new stories I, I don't I just think that the the idea of the perturbation of a record and how important it is for more than historians to be um, working with that material and also the interesting thing is that I mean the the book carved in stone was not actually affecting the historic like what the remnant of of the book so that I think the nature of the intervention is interesting as well because it wasn't the, um, th there was no disturbance of the historical record in the sense that it was being damaged. Yeah, that's I think what I meant by saying it doesn't, he, he, when I said he, he doesn't lie, what I meant was yeah. he doesn't like change, in, the, in this particular case it wasn't about rewriting a history with a new opposite fact um, that would be in contrast. I mean, there was no contrast. But I want to understand better what Brenda is saying. What is, what is the answer to the question from your perspective? In a superficial way, I was, I was thinking of my own PhD, um, which, which I did on a, um, on a, a large, the, the, the Chicago Colombian. Um, World's Fair at Chicago, 1893. 18, uh, mm -hmm. And I was looking at texts, uh, literature, novels, uh, essays, romances, um, storytelling, basically, uh, which would um, narrate or, you know, looking at an end of the 19th century, a uh, slightly different approach. But, but there was something to the open text that these texts did um, that, uh, you know, that enriched it, made it more complicated, um, sub, you know, subversive texts, uh, both affirmative and subversive, mythologizing them, um, and, and, mm. and so on and so forth. So, so I was thinking on that kind of um, level, basically. Um, but then also um, just asking myself in which ways, um, again, coming you know, more from a 19th century uh, perspective, um, those texts um, gave a certain authority to certain stories, whether they be true or not, through certain channels. So that was part of my question. That, that is just, uh, and 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 also from from newer work, uh, which I've you know done in documentary film, uh, this this kind of you know wh where you have this evidence-based desire, you know, to, to 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 give evidence to something that, at least it's. I mean, we we know that's not true, but you know, so something that's that's been there, and, and you, you tell stories about it, kind of you know, historical, uh, historically specific, politically kind of you know, important or so context. So, so when you mentioned, you know, works working within highly politicized, I mean, environments, you know, it is, uh, it's 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 not as if 
it is just Kabul or it is just Afghanistan. There is, there is in the, once you approach, you know, the, with, with your knowledge, um, you know, our Western knowledge, and you have to you know, kind of break it down, what kind of knowledge it is. Um, th these, these are representative objects, or, you know, not, not representatives, but objects of representation. And, and it is a question of representation that you then enter into to a certain extent. Um, so, so again, I was, I was thinking about what, what do you do with the stories that actually that, you know, this, these two days were so rich and so, so kind of overwhelmingly kind of, you know, even exciting, fascinating, you know, listening to your stories. Um, so, so I take with me some embodied knowledge of a historical, a very particular moment here with you um, that, that I in a way want to share. Um, that I want to respond to, but I don't know how. <laughs> um, that I want to, to, you know, open up to other people to share with me, blah blah blah. All all these things, and, and you know, all this was I, I haven't thought it through at all. Um, but it, it kind of came together in this yeah. very kind of you know well, very uh, well formulated. Well, question. Well, I, I mean, one yeah, <laughs> one part of me <laughs> says that I don't want to go down the road of saying, of being prescriptive and saying what political effects this work will have or has or has had because I think that's contradictory to the task yeah. basically I'm not expecting no no that. but I mean if, if that were I mean I um, I think this type for example this artwork of of Michael Rakovitz actually changes a lot on, on it. I mean, it, it intervenes into a very delicate, not only cultural politics, but political situation in Afghanistan, as does, as did the whole documenta, I think. Mm -hmm. But I can't go out and say, this was all done because what Mike and I really want is that everybody, you know, the foreigners leave, that, that, they, that they get the hell out, and that the Afghan people in Bamiyan just redo the Buddhas. And um, I mean, that's, that would be for me not, it might be true in the sense that what I'm interested in is that the forms of life and the forms of art somehow coincide. It's about forms of life, forme di vita, in the way that Agamben might speak of that. F that the forms of life and the forms of art are one. So in a way, it's like a very old vision. <laughs> it's like Joseph Boyce's vision, although he was a little bit, uh, a little bit, maybe not always sincere, but he, officially, I mean, and, and in many moments of his work, that idea was at the basis of it. So, you know, everyone is an artist in a way. Okay. Uh, life can be lived artistically. Art, not only every person, but every molecule, every bacteria. I mean, it, it has, it's, a, it's a kind of ecological vision also. I mean, I, I'm interested in degrowth, in economic degrowth. I'm interested in ecology. Um, but if I say that, oh, I'm an environmentalist, it's immediately false, because being Adornoin, when you say something, it's false. The minute you say it, you know, it becomes this frame to just kind of, it, it, it's, it's quite unethical, I think, to mm -hmm. state, in, in, from my perspective, to state that uh, too explicitly. But you could say that I am in favor in the, I'm in favor, I think the world will be better. What Karen Barad says is committed to justice or whatever you want to call it, this kind of commitment just as I have an idea in what direction maybe it would be a good idea that the planet went <laughs> and people. And I have this idea. And I think art is a very, because of its amateurness, because it's an amateur activity in the sense of amare and amatore, amatoriale. Um, you know, Juliana Rebenti, she's now writing a book about the amateur, the artist as the amateur. And so because it is an amateur activity, um, you can learn painting really quickly. Somebody can give you two or three classes, and then you make a lot of paintings for you. And even the so-called most professional artist is an amateur. 
because it's open to all possible knowledges, all possible media, all po and you take these leaps of going into things you don't know and bringing them together, it's possible that the artistic self, rather than being the alienated, the prototype of the alienated creative laborer of the 21st century, could be also, but it sounds so naive, you know, could be also the way to arrive at this identification between forms of life and forms of art. So that's kind of where I lie. And all of these are just examples and small, um, small cases, not case studies, because I'm not interested in making case studies. I'm not a historian. I'm interested in making cases and in being in the generative, the location where the generativeness can, the worlding can occur setting the stage and the conditions for which these things can occur. It wasn't, me, it wasn't my idea to, to do the workshop for the Bhaiman Buddhists. It wasn't even my idea to, to you know, discuss whether uh, they should be rebuilt or not, in a way. I mean, that all comes from Mike. All I did was think that Mike's work in Baghdad made sense for him to look at this. So it's like, hey, look at this, you know? It's like, why don't you read this? So this is almost a mediator function, you know? Not a mediator, but a... A what? Facilitate. Yeah. Hermes. 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 But, but, uh, but I do, so, so Alison, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It was just when you were talking about uh, the amateur. Oh, yeah. I was just thinking that's where we need the Alfred Jell piece. It would be oh, fantastic yes. at th that very point to read that piece and the role of technology, how he theorizes technology. The role yes. of technology. So, yes, uh, because um, for him, the artist is not the amateur, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, that means no Mario Garcia Torres, though, does it? Well, okay, I mean, I can do that in two seconds, Mario, and then we can read. So it's, it's just quick. Just, so Mario was looking for this one hotel. This is a picture by Alighiero Buetti uh, where, with the sign, one hotel on the road. It's on Chicken Street. It's actually parallel to Chicken Street. And this is Alighiero in the garden of the one hotel uh, he, uh, one day with his owl. And this in Castle is the first tapestry made in the one hotel, which was in 1971 when he was invited to the Documenta. Oh, look at the redness. Hmm? Look at the scale of that redness. Yes. Look at the scale of that redness. Yeah. 1971. <laughs> um, and this tapestry uh, so was, empire. I think, well, it, it is, uh, no, it's, it's the one minute thing. So the one minute thing, and what was also shown is uh, the faxes that were the previous to the documental work by Mario Garcia Torres looking for the one hotel by sending these fictional faxes from his studio where he was, when everyone was looking for Osama bin Laden, he was looking for the one hotel. And this is the, in the castle, we showed the faxes, so the earlier work, and we showed an earlier work called Alguna Ves, which he had made before going to Kabul. And this work actually has more to do with um, knowledge in the digital age, actually, and what is, what, how you acquire knowledge uh, uh, through images on the internet, Wikipedia, this and that, finding people who may have a photograph from the 70s that they, so how you can do a sort of archival research at a distance and the limits and possibilities and the poetries of that and also the problems of that. And when he came to Afghanistan, uh, we looked for the one hotel and there's a number of people that helped and this is the one hotel as it is today, before he, not today, before he rented it. And then we, he rented the place, and as you can see, the building doesn't have the bars anymore. Uh, the photograph, the previous photograph was taken from this direction. So he, here is the back of the garden would be over here somewhere. And uh, th so this is uh, the way that it was used by, Ali, by Mario as a place for meeting. That's Chus Martinez from, from the behind. That's Abbasin Nesar, who was the project manager in Kabul. This is the filmmaker and artist Barmaka Kram uh, from Afghanistan, and that's Natasha Zadar. And uh, he made a film called Tea, 
during his time there. And these are some film stills of T. So it's the second film he made. Uh, T is a very interesting uh, film. So he didn't only rent the one hotel and f make it into a facilitation. He also made this film over the year and a half of being there. And the different um, seasons and, and snow in front of the one hotel and the different, it gives a sense of a long time, you know, a duration that over which period this film was made. And what occurs actually, and it starts, this is a very early still from the film, it, it, it um, starts with this reference again to the mediated knowledge, to the non-direct knowledge, and it, it, it is a road trip. It's made under the form of a road trip where images, that's Mario in it, ultimately most of it was ended up filming uh, in Mexico, because he's from Mexico. So what happens is that it mixes images of his landscape in Mexico with uh, Afghanistan uh, areas near Bamiyan or on the way to Bamiyan. And it speaks about this overlapping confusion in his own mind between his, um, his life in, in Mexico and his life in, because he was dividing his time between Mexico and Kabul the way that Alighiero was dividing his time between Torino and Kabul. So it turns into this um, back and forth where you actually can't feel much of the difference in the way that, it, that it's done. The film was screened only once in Kassel for the same reasons that Francis Alice refused to show his film in Kassel and it's on the internet however, you can, anybody can watch it. And uh, the same reason why Tacita Dean didn't want to, or Mike Rakovitz didn't want to show the workshop students' work. He, so, but it was shown every day in the exhibition there, and it, and it exists as a piece today. So <laughs> that's a sort of short version of his work. And I just take one more minute to switch over to the laptop, hopefully. Because, uh, as I mentioned to you, the <coughs> in this case, the reason I invited um, Mario was because he had been working on the one hotel, so our both interests joined. My story with Boeti, he had never met Boeti, and his own interest. And his preceding work, the one that I mentioned, was shown at the Reina Sofia a year or two before the Documenta opened. It's a 2009 piece. Um, I'm going to show you just a few minutes about it. But this is the um, text that he speaks as a voiceover. Because it's in Spanish, I thought I would show it to you a minute. Um, that's not the voiceover, though. This is, the, um, this is my essay. <laughs> this is, sorry, this is my text <coughs> describing the, um, the piece Alguna Vez that I wrote for him as an introduction to his piece for the Reina Sofia. So this was in a kind of a brochure. So I wrote that it was a slide projection with a voiceover, um, with a controlled emotion. Uh, it was a very descriptive and neutral tone. It's about storytelling itself. It's interesting because in relation to your question about storytelling, it's actually about how a story is constructed and how a story is told and how different stories are embedded in a story. A kind of uh, diaporama in the sense that it's slides that are one uh, after the other. But he tells um, not only the story of Boetti in the 70s, but he tells his own story of searching for these uh, information and elements in, in a particular choreography that brings together the movements from looking at satellite views to other uh, forms of documentation. And the voiceover, um, hmm. uh, it's, well that has something to do with the documenta, what, the, the way that that ends. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to tell you the voiceover a little bit, but I can't find it right now. Let me see if it's here. Uh, here's the script. Okay, this is the script in English. Uh, it had a title at the end. It was Alguna Vez. I have all this junk, you know. It's like God knows before and after in the, in the middle of artworks. So he says in Spanish, stories are made of fractions of other stories. Some details make some stories more interesting than others. Not all interconnected stories happen all 
happen at the same time. Sometimes they share places, other times they share people, and ideas happening concurrently, but they can also share subjects that are spread out in time. These are like the stories that Mike interwove. The story I'm about to tell has to do with one subject and some other stories. I have been told. Even though I might at times get carried away and let my subjective self be seen through, I will try to stick to the available data as much as possible. And the storyteller goes on and all. This picture was taken in the outskirts of Kabul, Afghanistan. One could say a partial view of Kabul is depicted, although not it's, it's not the main subject. It was taken sometime in 71 by a man named Piet van Vardigen. So this is historic, a historian might be collecting these materials, but it's used in a different way. Uh, we don't know who Peter van Vardigen is. It's probably someone he found through the internet and over it. But the image is, is important because it is, it is taken at the same time as our story begins, and so on and so forth. So now, I'm not going to um, read you the whole translation, but I would like you to get briefly a sense of the atmosphere of the piece, just to, I think the sound is on, yep. Algunos relatos están hechos de fracciones de otros relatos. It starts in the dark. Estos pueden ser contados muchas veces. They can be told Pero many cada times. vez que se cuentan, se diferencian unos de otros por pequeños detalles. Each time you tell the story, there are different details that distinguish it. Son precisamente los detalles los que hacen que algunas narrativas resulten más interesantes que otras. It's the details that make some more interesting. Ciertos relatos se extienden en el tiempo. Some take long Otros time. habitan tan solo breves instantes. Some last just a few instants. Otros más comparten el mismo momento. Some are at the same time. Divide Algunos the same time. Algunos comparten lugares y a veces personajes e ideas some que share se presentan people. de manera concurrente o que viajan en el tiempo a través de ellos. That's La narración que estoy a punto de referir tiene que ver con un tema específico y con otras historias que me han contado. Do you understand a little bit? This, this story Aunque that I'm about to tell is a specific one. Quiero dejar en claro que esta historia proviene de un hecho real. I want to tell you that this story is based on a real fact. A la información de la que dispongo. And it's based on the information I have. This is two years before he went se set foot to come. De un relato que no solo se conforma por lo que mis fuentes me han informado, sino además por todo aquello que he podido observar e inducir a través de una serie de fotografías de un lugar en el que everything jamás he estado. Everything that I could, he's speaking about his sources, everything that he could observe and used. There's images. I just want to get to the first image or two, and then we finish. Esta imagen fue tomada a las afueras de Kabul, Afganistán. Podría decirse que representa una vista parcial de la ciudad, aunque este no haya sido su objetivo principal. Fue capturada en algún momento de 1971 okay, so por un this individuo is... llamado Peter van Fardingen. Okay, this is sort of the way it, de la presencia militar, this is the, que marca la diferencia central en esta imagen, the history notar un detalle menos visible. The, during the Soviet no period, he's talking about a difference between the way that the airport looked sur, in the Soviet period and in the period before. La palabra Kabul han desaparecido de la torre de control. No sé si tiene sentido iniciar una discusión acerca de esto. Sin embargo, con el propósito de dar continuidad a este razonamiento... So, it go, so the whole history of Afghanistan is somehow embedded within this history and story of the One Hotel. Después de esta fotografía nos hace replantearnos la ubicación del establecimiento. So it just... Um, a través desde la historia del arte. He's talking about art history and how art history is told. Ha estado ahí. Para los habitantes de Sharenau, 
esto probablemente no tenga relevancia alguna pues fue en realidad for the people of Sharanao it doesn't have any relevance and most have forgotten the existence of this one hotel queda por verse si la reaparición del hotel consigue sumarse a las narrativas sobre el tema que hasta hoy circula si bien algunas veces rumores y especulaciones consiguen convertirse en cánones históricos, how do rumors and certain stories become historical canons? And, I mean, we could just analyze this for two days in an institute, you know, it's Desde amazing, it's almost finished. Años, es posible decir que Alighiero Boetti escogió bien. Kabul sea quizá el sitio ideal para repensar la historia y las distintas maneras en que se cuenta un relato. Ha, Kabul and one hotel is a este perfect es way of thinking about how a story can be told and what are the elements cierto. of a story. Hmm. Las historias, la gente y los edificios de la ciudad efectivamente se esfuman sin dejar rastro, pero en ocasiones but sometimes they reappear. Cities, images, facades seem to disappear into the background, but sometimes on some occasions they reappear. <laughs> it's beautiful. This is a beautiful piece. So there you go. I think that it's a little bit of an introduction to his work, uh, very little, but enough to know that there was a story to tell. <sighs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm just saying that you're, you know, you're standing uh, with this map behind where we stopped in that first question that you posed. And we've now actually begun to understand what this, you know, three-dimensional, multi-leveled aspect of the way that you plotted out the four different sites and things, so that these, these particular stories. Um, when we set this up, this idea of the Institute, um, it was an experiment. It's a kind of pedagogical experiment, which depends very much on those who come and those who stay and who join the, the, the journey with us. And um, one of the things that Carolyn and I have been talking about is, you know, obviously what we're going to do in the, the next two. She's also going to be visiting the university, not for an institute. She's also coming to the University of Huddersfield for a um, a research event and other things. And then there's, uh, she's going to be working with graduate students, she's going to come to different seminars, and there will be a sort of in-house seminar for us to perhaps do more readings and keep up with some of these things um, through the next you know, six months, uh, when and, you know, with, with and without Carolyn. I mean, I'm mostly, you know, these, the, the seminar program will be events, so we'll do some more reading. So we've got a very rich reader. Um, we may add more to it for, the next one, but we'll certainly obviously come back to various aspects. Yes, I would like to add a few things. Yeah. yeah, so there will be sort of additional things. So what will happen now is that you've signed up, etc. you will get information, you will disseminate it to other people, you will encourage other people to realize that if they're not here today, they have missed something quite extraordinary and that people must learn to it would be to, nice to grasp More the this merrier. it's <laughs> difficult for people who are not full-time students or yeah. students yeah. or whatever to, yeah. to 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 find time and we'll give them a lot more time to say to book but do pass the, the message on that oh, this sorry. is something very particular and spectacular to come to um so there will be a website eventually and with Slight additions, certain things will be there. So there's a perpetual record of this as a, a resource for your own learning, for your own thinking, for your own continuation, etc. But we, as I said at the beginning, we're starting an adventure that lasts now seven months. Um, yes, you yeah, know, wonderful. in various ways, and it just is extraordinary to be with you. I think, and to to have the chance to have this in depth process and every uh, process of your th the way you think the way you put things together and the way you've actually put this particular event I, I think is an instruction not an instruction but it is an it, you know it, it's just changing our ways of thinking and we will take time to absorb it and to keep reading and to keep thinking and then we'll have these further meetings as we go along and discover what this particular way of working with you will be so I mean, I, I don't want to kind of close this down, but I think maybe if people want to say anything, just to... Yes. I think we have, no, a little time, we, 15 well, minutes? I, uh, or just a few minutes, because I think oh. we, I promised... You ah, know, we had to finish earlier about today. About 5.30 today. Ah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So, so but we can do that kind of off, off the record. Off the record, we can a few okay? stay so a little bit. So I think bit. what I'll do is formally 
thank okay. you enormously for okay. this. Well, uh, I would like to thank all of you formally well, no, as no, well. We're, <laughs> we're just going to thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and then we can formally bring it to the end. And if you do have further questions, we yes, can yes, chat yes. amongst yes. ourselves.